on the existence of national identity before imagined communities, the example of the Assyrians of Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and Persia by Hannibal Travis. Studies on nationalism and the emergence of modern ethnic identities rarely examine sources dating from the period between 0 CE and 1453 CE, or the period between the fall of the new Assyrian Empire in the mid-first millennium BCE and the age of discovery in the mid-second millennium CE. Testing generally accepted theories of national and ethnic distinctiveness against these sources reveals that a similar case exists for the existence of an Assyrian identity and nation, same as for a Greek, Kurdish, Jewish, or Persian identity or nation. Assyrian populations, religions, and political formations survived in present-day Iraq, Iran, and Turkey from 0 CE well into the 1800s CE. Commentators on modern nationalism in relation to Assyrian identity have assumed, with little evidence, that the non-Arab, non-Jewish peoples of the East lack the agency or the intellect to maintain a consistent identity or national movement, and that these peoples relied in their ignorance and indolence on the theories of Western missionaries and colonial officials. In the 1980s, a new generation of scholars emerged who posited that nations and peoples emerged in conjunction with modern capitalistic cultural forms and secular nationalistic liberalism. The new theory of imagined communities represented a departure from a long tradition of historical and cultural work which assumed nations and peoples as subjects of analysis without critically examining the linguistic, cultural or religious foundations of these groups of individuals or families. This new theory, however, has the risk of degenerating into a vulgar instrumentalism which speculates that identity entrepreneurs can manufacture ethnic, racial, or religious identity for their own purposes and little objective foundation. Thus, more recent research points out the flaws in grounding national and ethnic distinctions in modern nationalism by compiling evidence that nations and peoples perceived themselves and were perceived as such by other collectivities long before the rise of European humanism or enlightenment. This study attempts to show that the longevity and diversity of national and ethnic distinctions undermine a one-size-fits-all explanation of such distinctions in the manner of Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. The evidence from the Assyrian case suggests that the undifferentiated hordes of Asia did not coalesce and order themselves in modern times and under Western influence into nations created and sustained by advanced technology. This imagined community's narrative suffers from hindsight bias and an exaggerated Eurocentrism. It also insults and infantilizes the peoples and nations of pre-modern eras and non-Western regions by assuming they lack the intelligence with which modern Europeans constructed national cultures, laws, literatures, schools, and economies. Historians have long since disproved such ideas. By examining translations of an academic commentary on Aramaic, Greek, Roman, and Persian literature and inscriptions, among other sources, this essay demonstrates that the British Empire invented neither the modern Assyrians as a people nor the th territory of modern Assyria that was considered for statehood by the League of Nations after World War I. Let's read this again. By examining translations of and academic commentary on Aramaic, Greek, Roman, and Persian literature and inscriptions, among other sources, this essay demonstrates that the British Empire invented neither the modern Assyrians as a people nor the territory of modern Assyria that was considered for statehood by the League of Nations after World War I. Rather, the identification of present-day northern Iraq, northwestern Persia, and south southeastern Turkey as Assyria draws support from the Middle Assyrian and Neo-Assyrian usage of the 2nd and the 3rd millennia BCE and the Greek, Roman, Persian, and Aramaic usage in the 1st millennium CE. Finally, the contribution of ancient Assyria to the cultures, languages, and religions of the non-Muslim populations of contemporary Iran, Iraq, and Turkey may no longer be doubted, especially when it comes to the Assyrian Christians, Mandians, and Yazidis. 
This ancient contribution is present in these people's daily vocabularies and place names and indigenous beliefs. Uh, the title is uh, Counterinsurgency as slash and Genocidal Intent, the Ottoman Christians from 1843 to 1923. And my work for the past 10 years has been attempting to apply some of the lessons or the jurisprudence of the international criminal tribunals, uh, most particularly the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and now the ICC, uh, to the documentary evidence, particularly the German documentary evidence of uh, what happened to the Ottoman Christians uh, between 1914 and, and the 1920s. Uh, as well as going back to the 19th century uh, as necessary. So to take uh, some book titles as a point of departure, it's been common in recent years by uh, Edward J. Erickson, uh, Gunter Louis, Michael Gunter, a number of other American and, and European scholars, to argue that there was not a genocide of the Armenians or other Christians. Instead, there were uh, forced relocations as a counterinsurgency technique that is common in history, uh, it was perpetrated by the United States in, in the Philippines and Cuba, by Russia in the Caucasus, by other countries in a variety of locations. And, and Erickson, for example, says that um, there was an invasion by Russia of the Ottoman Empire supported by Armenian guerrillas, necessitating uh, militarily uh, a population relocation strategy uh, that was entirely reasonable and, and normal military doctrine for the time. Uh, this is similar to the publications of the Turkish Historical Society, which refer not to an Armenian or other genocide, but to a tragedy of Anatolia, uh, the destruction of the Ottoman Empire by the minorities working with the foreign imperialist powers, uh, major power policy uh, victimizing the Christians uh, as a result of their strategic manipulation, um, the allegations of genocide being presented as a myth, uh, and, as of a, and as a genocide of truth. They, they, there's a website by that title that you often see in Google search results for the Armenian genocide. Uh, Justin McCarthy is a, a leading proponent of this thesis in the United States and um, has testified before Congress and, and appeared in Australia on this matter and other places. Um, basically, he argues there was an ethnic cleansing of Ottoman Muslims led by Russia, but with the Armenians and other Christians, especially the Greeks, as the sort of subordinate or, or local allies of the Russians. Uh, it's a more recent book is The Armenian Rebellion at Bonn, um, saying similar to what uh, Salahi Sonyal and others say, that really there was an insurgency and, and the Ottomans used normal techniques to put it down. I'm now going to turn to the jurisprudence of the International Criminal Tribunals to see whether this argument is valid in terms of uh, the definition of genocide that it implies and applies. The Convention of 1948 states in Article 2 that genocide is uh, one of a certain list of acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, in whole or in part a group uh, having certain characteristics, ethnic, racial, or religious. And those acts include killing, causing serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in part, imposing measures to prevent births within the group, or removing children from their group and putting them in another group. And uh, the preamble to the convention says that genocide has occurred at all periods of history. And it was applied retroactively to the Holocaust by the Polish National Tribunal uh, and in the Eichmann case. So it is not necessarily limited in time prospectively from 1951 onwards. The question then becomes, what is intent to destroy? Uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia has defined it as revenge or animus stated that the Bosnian Serb leadership, uh, Karadzic, Miladic, uh, Kerstic, uh, wanted revenge against the Muslims for uh, rebelling against Yugoslavia, killing local Serbs um, in Sarajevo and elsewhere, and therefore they, they acted out this animus with calls for ethnic or religious cleansing of what they called the Turks uh, or the Muslims of Yugoslavia. Uh, they used religious slurs against them and Genocidal intent was inferred from the conduct of the Bosnian Serb army and the Bosnian Serb police and, and sort of paramilitaries or civilians. Uh, and it was, in particular, it was inferred from patterns and a scale of conduct that was widespread and that included torture, psychological abuse, rape, detention in substandard conditions, denial of food, water, clothing, or hygienic shelter, uh, and the destruction or targeting of mosques. 
The next argument you often confront is that, well, assuming that's the definition, there's no evidence that this occurred in the Ottoman case other than what biased missionaries had to say. Missionaries hated the Turks. Uh, this is uh, Justin McCarthy's thesis in, in the book The Turk in America, uh, and that the missionaries sort of made all this up uh, to make the Turks look bad, help the British and the Russians take over and carve up the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I argue this is not accurate. If you read the Ottomans' memoirs and other uh, sort of um, Turkish nationalist memoirs uh, and Turkish historians' books, they speak of at least 600,000 Armenian deaths. So that, th these people are not missionaries. Uh, they're saying uh, Jamal Pasha, uh, one of the triumvirate, Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior, Mustafa Kemal, uh, the leader of modern Turkey, the founder of modern Turkey, uh, Rauf Orbe, his close ally, uh, the Ottoman Gazette, uh, all of them referred to 600,000 to 800,000 Armenian deaths. Um, Mustafa Kemal was also quoted in the 1920s as saying, millions of our Christian subjects have been massacred by the Young Turks regime uh, and that these people should be held accountable as they were then being held accountable uh, for that pattern of conduct. Uh, let's look at some other evidence. So the Ottoman Director General of the Settlement of Refugees, quote unquote, said that only 10% of the deportees survived. Uh, there were no Armenians left in Diyarbakir, according to Rashid Bey, uh, who was in charge of the area. Uh, the Sultan Mehmet VI talked about crimes against humanity, namely massacres perpetrated in Turkey during the war, during which subjects of non-Turkish race have been forcibly driven from their homes by fear of massacre since January 1st, 1914. Uh, and it's important, I think, to go back to 1913 and 1914 and not simply speak of the events of 1915 because they didn't begin in 1915, um, as this quote, among others, shows. If you look at the website of the Turkish Foreign Ministry today, they focus, like Justin McCarthy and others, and er on Erickson on the massive rebellions of the Armenians and, and what they call Syriacs, uh, at Van and Mardin. Um, the U.S. Ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, as you may know, wrote to the Secretary of State that there was a campaign of race extermination under a pretext of reprisal against rebellion. So rebellion did come into play, but as a pretext, he said, which means a false excuse. Uh, the German and other U.S. diplomats agreed that there was no real rebellion, but more scattered resistance. And at, at one point, the Germans call it a brave resistance um, to massacre. So uh, to quote ambassadors Metternich and Morgenthau, the uprising in Van was provoked through acts of oppression of the Armenian inhabitants by the Turkish officials and soldiery. Another quote, the famous revolution of the Armenians was merely the determination of them to save their women's honor and their own lives after the Turks, by massacring thousands of their neighbors, had shown them the fate that awaited them. Uh, and 55,000 Armenians were killed in the vicinity of Van alone, versus 300 rifles being recovered. So there's a massive disproportion in the targeting of unarmed people. Also, the American report, the Harbord report of the American military mission to Armenia, said the massacres and deportations were organized in the spring of 1915. Numbers of people were murdered by savage Kurds, which is his phrasing, uh, of the female refugees numbered 75,000, 40% of them were infected by venereal disease due to rape and mass rape. And the, the final quote they have is that, surely no faith has ever been cherished at a greater cost than the Christian faith in the Ottoman Empire. Major Noel, a uh, report from special duty in Mardin in 1919, said no secret supplies of arms were found in Mardin uh, by frequent searches carried out by the Ottomans house to house. Uh, then he said, even if the Armenian treason could be proved to the hilt, the Chaldeans and Syrians, in other words, the Assyrians, were not parties to it. And he said, there are many cases at present where Christian children are being ransomed by Kurdish families since an appeal to the Turkish authorities would merely result in the child being done away with, namely killed. So the children have been removed from their homes, they're being held for ransom or, or as slaves, and they're going to be killed if, if anybody attempts to take them away. Uh, he continues in his report. The bodies of the deportees are left naked on the plains, the men on their stomachs, the women on their back. The women were, quote, made to undress, and this was followed by a general carnage in which the local Kurds participated. The sword and Kurdish dagger were preferred. Quote, the women were stripped and raped. Some of the younger ones are spared to be sold as slaves. And finally, there are many children and women in positions of slaves, both in Diyarbakir and in the district surrounding it. This is similar to what the famous Blue Book said of the, of the British. Uh, first they killed the men, then they took the women, those who had not escaped, and carried them away, and finally they plundered and burned the villages. 
So when Justin McCarthy and, and Gunter Louis and others say that the, the, the Blue Book was made up, biased missionary reports, it's confirmed by what the Germans said, by what the American military mission said, and, and by what the Ottomans have said. Uh, Ambassador von Genheim of, of, of the German Empire, Interior Minister Talat told the German embassy that indigenous Christians would be thoroughly cleansed under the cover of war. That's the same term used by Hitler, cleansing or house cleaning uh, for the Jews. Uh, this same compilation of German diplomatic reports says that the deportees were led through bands of Kurds, which killed men and carried away the women. The Kurds and the gendarmes cut the heads off the men and many women and children were taken away. Uh, same uh, book, Armenian deportee convoys were completely robbed and women and children were kidnapped by local Arabs, Circassians, and Kurds in Rasul Ain. Girls and young women were enslaved in the Kurdish villages and boy children were often stolen from their parents, Article 2 E, uh, forcible removal of children, prevention of births to the slaves. Men were murdered, girls were captured and sold or badly violated. A Turkish inspector told me, said a German, we no longer have any idea how many women and girls have been abducted by the Arabs and the Kurds, either by force or with the government's approval implicitly. Uh, Kurdish forces working with the officials of Diyarbakir uh, were massacring entire Christian towns. The gendarmes sold the women and girls to local populations, often the Kurds, near Mardin and Harput. Dysentery, smallpox, gangrene, fever, and other diseases were proliferating among the, the women and the, and the deportees. The convoys were denied the ability to drink water, even from the rivers. That's satisfying Article 2C of the Genocide Convention. Young boys were separated from the convoys and killed, while, while girls were sold by gendarmes or Tur Kurdish forces or gifted uh, among Kurds and Turks. The deportees arrived without clothes in Tel Abiyad, mostly elderly people. Uh, this is the Times of, of London from 1920, Chaldean victims of the Turks. Inspired by religious fanaticism and by their hatred of the Christians, the Turkish government made a veritable shambles filled with the remains of our unhappy children out of our country and of a large part of Mesopotamia inhabited by the Chaldeans. That's a, a Chaldean bishop speaking. Uh, Jamal Pasha in his memoirs uh, talks about the motive of revenge. He says the responsibility for all this must lie with the Muscovite policy which made mortal enemies of three nations who for centuries had lived together in peace. Uh, ignoring all the 19th century massacres and the 18th century massacres in, in that statement. Uh, his other quote is, by these measures, they have opened the way for the crimes perpetrated by the Kurds and Turks. By way of comparison, Hitler said um, that what he was doing was because the Poles had persecuted Germans with a bloody uh, terror, evic evicting them from Danzig um, in Poland. The destruction of Poland was in the foreground of his policy, and he wanted a new German frontier according to healthy principles. This is just like Anver wanted uh, a new healthy Ottoman frontier uh, that would be protectable from the Russians. Uh, if you go back to the 19th century, the massacres perpetrated there were already more severe than many adjudicated as genocide by the Yugoslavia and the Rwanda tribunals. Um, you know, Srebrenica, they talk about 8,000 dead or missing. Taba commune of, commune of Rwanda, they talk about 2,000. In 1895, uh, Westerners spoke of, you know, 50 to 200,000. Uh, and that's just in 1895 to 1896, not even including 1915. Uh, and there's a quote from a, uh, an Assyrian manuscript from that time. In the city of Amid or Diyarbakir and the villages round about, and in Sirt and Batlis, and in all the countryside and cities and villages where there were Syrians and Armenians, they killed them without mercy and their wives and children were taken away captive. This is 20 years before World War I. You look at oral histories from Assyrians, they've been compiled by Nuri Kino and, and the Australian Academic Society of Assyrians and other people. Uh, this woman uh, spoke to a documentarian who said her mother and aunt were slain, her aunt's daughters were taken away captive. Somehow she survived um, what she might have looked like back then. Uh, another man, they burned our churches, they provoked the Kurds to take our women and rape them. Those that refused to convert were slaughtered. Another man, the Turks and Kurds killed 400 of our villagers and burned our churches and forced us out. Many of our girls were forcefully taken by the Turks. On the way, we abandoned my brother Elisha, who was sick. Uh, the, Ar the Assyrian patriarch said, after declaring jihad, the Turks decided to wipe us out like the Armenians and let us be attacked by their troops and by the Kurds among whom we live. At the end of May, the official massacres and devastations in our villages began. Our people are now surrounded, their food is running out, and there are epidemics. The Assyrian bishop of Salamis in, in Persia said, the young women and girls were abducted by Persian bigwigs, above all a certain Timur Aga, one of the Kurd Simcoe's closest associates and the mastermind of these atrocities in the area. This happened all up and down the, the uh, coast of Lake Ermia. The Ottoman uh, 
Kurdish parliamentarian Ilya Sami said, facing the threat of an attempt on his life and of aggression, he, meaning Turkey, delivered a powerful punch. As a result, our citizens were deported and destroyed, but 80% of them were innocent people. Another issue that comes up is there were no trials of the Ottomans other than the Malta trials, which the British had to dismiss for lack of evidence. Uh, that's false. The Ottoman attorney general led a trial process, and he spoke of crimes against humanity. Um, this is him, I believe, in, in the middle of a picture of our Orbe and Kamal in 1919, although it could be another Sami. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other claim is that there is no Turkish racism, so you can't compare what happened to the Holocaust or other genocides. Uh, the Jews were completely defenseless, and uh, the, the Germans were rabid anti-Semites, whereas the Armenians were armed to the, to the teeth, and there were, there were no Kur, uh, Turkish anti-Armenians. That's actually false. The Armenians suffered even worse pogroms than the Jews in the 19th century, and the Assyrians lost uh, up to 70,000, and the Greeks up to 70,000 in the 19th century. Um, so even worse racism than against the Jews. Uh, there's other evidence of racism. I'm not going to uh, uh, linger on it here. Turkey has used the Genocide Convention in much smaller cases of massacre than the Armenians and Assyrians. In Cyprus, a couple dozen Turks were killed and, and a few women were uh, assaulted. They called it a genocide of the Turks in Cyprus and invaded the country, drove the Christians out of the north. Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, there was talk of 250,000 deaths by 1993. Turkey uh, promptly said it's a genocide by the form of ethnic cleansing. Kosovo in 1999, there were reports of 10,000 missing men, immediately called the genocide, the country was bombed. Um, Palestine, Turkey calls it genocide there. Uh, China, in East Turkestan, China, there have been riots of affecting about 200 people. Turkey calls that a genocide. Uh, and in Syria, there were, there were a massacre of about 40 people in Banias. Erdogan called that a genocide. Was there a reciprocal genocide? Professor Ungor says there was a reciprocal genocide of the Kurds by the Assyrians. So we shouldn't talk of an Assyrian genocide without talking about the Kurdish genocide by the Assyrians or something like that. Or maybe the Russians did the same thing to the Sarkassians or the, in the Balkan Wars, the same thing was done to the Turks. Uh, I don't think it's, it's a proper equivalency or that the, the two cases stand on the same footing. If you look at the Circassians, there were 435,000 of them in 1833 and 568,000 of them in 1989. And if you combine the Circassians and the Chechens, they tripled between 1833 and 1989. So they weren't wiped out. Even 90%, not even 90% were killed. Did the Americans do the same thing to the Filipinos and the Cubans, like Erickson says? Also not accurate. You look at before and after for the, for Philippine, uh, for the Philippines and Cuba, the population increased uh, by at least 10% in both places during the American occupation. Uh, then if you look at what happened to the Armenians, the Syrians, and Greeks, there were four to six million of them in 1880, but only 78,000 in 1990, more than 90% reduction. There were only 225,000 left in 1935. Whereas the Kurds, there were 1 million in 1880 and 1.5 million in 1935 and 7 million by 1990. If the Christians had increased at the same rate as the Kurds, there would have been 35 million in 1990. There's a huge gap in population uh, that's been uh, not born. Uh, the percentage Kurdish of the provinces of the East is up to 90% today. So if there was an Assyrian genocide of the Kurds, as Professor Ungor says, it was extremely ineffective. Uh, they constitute the vast majority of, of people living in Hakkari, Sirt, Mardin, Diyarbakir, a huge area of Eastern Turkey. Uh, there were more Jews surviving in displaced person camps in France and Germany after World War II than Christians surviving in Turkey by 1927. The only 2.5% of Bosnian residents, according to the 1991 census, were confirmed dead by 1996, uh, whereas it's at least uh, a third in the Ottoman Christian case, probably more like two-thirds. Uh, in Rwanda, the... Um, some members of the victim group joined mem parts of the Ugandan army that came in to uh, liberate the country, and they actually uh, won the war. Two million Hutus fled the country, and a Tutsi, a, a member of the victim group, uh, became the sole president of the country since 2000. If an Armenian or a Syrian had become president of Turkey in 1927, I don't think we would today even be talking about a genocide of the Armenians and Assyrians. Uh, so finally, I would like to conclude with what Raphael Lemkin had to say about the nature of genocide. He called it denationalization. The population not destroyed was to be integrated into the German pattern of culture, changing the political and demographic relationships in favor of Germany, an attempt to obliterate the cultural personality of a nation the imposition by a stronger nation of its national pattern on the weaker nation. That's exactly what happened in the, in the uh, Ottoman case. 
uh, by the denationalization of the of the East and its replacement by uh, Turkish and Kurdish populations. Thank you very much. The Assyrian Genocide, Cultural and Political Legacies, edited by Hannibal Travis. For a brief period, the attention of the international community has focused once again on the plight of religious minorities in Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. In particular, the abductions and massacres of Yazidis and Assyrians in the Sinjar, Mosul, Nineveh Plains, Baghdad, and Hasakah regions in 2007 through 2015 raised questions about the prevention of genocide. This book, while principally analyzing the Assyrian genocide of 1914 through 1925 and its implications for the culture and politics of the region, also raises broader questions concerning the future of religious diversity in the Middle East. It gathers and analyzes the findings of a broad spectrum of historical and scholarly works on Christian identities in the Middle East, genocide studies, international law, and the politics of the late Ottoman Empire, as well as the politics of Ottomans, British, and Russian rivals for power in Western Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. A key question the book raises is whether the fate of the Assyrians maps onto any of the concepts used within international law and diplomatic history to study genocide and group violence. In this light, the Assyrian genocide stands out as being several times larger in both absolute terms and relative to the size of the affected group than the Sibernisa genocide, which is recognized by Turkey as well as by the international tribunals and organizations, including its Armenian and Greek victims. The Ottoman Christian genocide rivals the Rwandan, Bengali, and Biafran genocides. The book also aims to explore the impact of the genocide period of 1914 to 1925 on the development or partial unraveling of Assyrian group cohesion, including aspirations to autonomy in the Assyrian areas of northern Iraq, northwestern Iran, and southeastern Turkey. Scholars from around the world have collaborated to approach these research questions by reference to diplomatic and political archives, international legal materials, memoirs, and literary works.